It is incredible. As I was watching those answers to prayer on the screen, I was crying because I couldn't help but think of the stories behind every one of those. That prayer that uh, my teenager is now <laughs> eating dinner with my family. Like, I got to tell you, if you knew the story behind that prayer, that is a powerful, powerful, thankful story of God's redeeming grace and God's power to redeem a life. I can tell you that it is, there is a story behind every one of those. There's a story as we read every scripture verse, as we read every story in the Bible, and I think sometimes we forget that because we aren't personally living it. And I think sometimes we need to go back into those stories, and that's what we're going to do this morning. We're going to go back into some stories of some real people praying real prayers just like we prayed and God answered, and they saw God answer, and we're going to celebrate Thanksgiving as a thankful people to God. For those of you that are parents or grandparents or aunts and uncles or honorary aunts and uncles to others, there are three words that we probably want our kids to learn in kindergarten. There are three words that most of us would say we learned in kindergarten. Important things to have learned in kindergarten. Every kindergarten teacher wants to make sure that kids get this besides learning that you can hide a piece of broccoli in a glass of milk. But there are other important things, and those are these three words, please, thank you, and I'm sorry. In fact, I've learned that this is really the cure to a great marriage too, isn't it? If you can remember these three words, please, thank you, and I'm sorry, your marriage is probably going to make it. In fact, I think there are times where if we just remember these three words in our marriage, our marriage would get a lot healthier. It's true in the workplace. If your employees say please and thank you and sorry as a boss, if you say please and sorry and thank you, you are going to have better relationships in the workplace. These three words that we were taught in kindergarten really help us in all areas of life. In fact, these three words are probably three of the most crucial words that we could learn in life in general, but also spiritually. Because please is an attitude to, of prayer, to say to God, God, please, would you answer my cry? And that is what he did, didn't he? Yeah. And I'm sorry is repentance. God, would you forgive me of my sins? Would you allow me to come in humility before your throne, before the cross, and say, God, I need to be forgiven. Would you forgive me? Repentance. And the third is thankfulness. It's an attitude towards God with your life, an attitude of gratitude towards God. That God, you've given me everything that I am and everything that I have, and my attitude towards you is one of gratitude. I am thankful, God, for what you have given me in my life. Let me put this in simple terms. My daughter Eden is in senior kindergarten now. That means that she goes for mornings from 9 to 11.30. Friday is my day off. Uh, Adrian's at work, Sparrow's in school till 3.30, and so Eden and I have the gift this year of 11.30 on Fridays till 3.30 on Fridays. We have four hours to spend with one another. And generally speaking, we do family chores, um, which is not that exciting for her, but there is one part that's fairly exciting for her, and that is going grocery shopping with Dad. Not because grocery shopping is all that exciting, but what do you get at the counter at Monsions as a kid, if you go to the counter, a cookie. And so Eden has learned that if she goes grocery shopping with dad on Friday, she is going to get a little tub of strawberry Hagendaz as she comes in the door, and we pay for it right there. And then she goes around and gets her free cookie, and she gets to eat a little tiny tub of strawberry Hagendaz and a cookie. And she gets excited about this. It's kind of our little routine on Fridays that mom doesn't know about. <laughs> Till now. And, uh, and as we come up to the counter, Eden's a little bit shy. But generally speaking, the Monsions person reaches across the counter and says, would you like a cookie? And hands her a cookie. And I kind of have to prompt her, not because she doesn't know what to say, but just because she's shy and she's probably hiding a little bit behind dad. And I say, what do you say? And she says, thank you. And I think that our Heavenly Father is an awful like 
a lot like me in that moment. That I'm just hoping that my daughter has a heart of gratitude for what she's receiving. And I think oftentimes in life, all of us are either too shy or, or we're forgetting our words or there's all kinds of reasons that we'd have. But we lose the attitude of gratitude for the things that God has given us in our lives. We miss out on the opportunity to give thanks. Throughout Scripture, we see all kinds of stories of real people struggling with an attitude of gratitude. In Numbers 11, you'll remember Quail Mageddon. We told, I told this story just a couple weeks ago. The story of Quail Mageddon where they prayed for a quail storm because the people were praying originally for manna. They were praying, God, would you give us manna? And God gave them manna from heaven. They had nothing to eat. They were starving to death in the desert. And God provided miraculously bread from heaven. And they were thankful. But then some of them wanted meat. They really wanted meat. And they began to pray, God, we're not satisfied with this miracle. We're not uh, okay with what you've given us. Give us more and more and more and more. And so God gave them the quail. But for those that had been ungrateful... There was a sickness within the quail, and they died. That's the part of the story I didn't tell you a couple weeks ago. It's kind of a twist in the ending, isn't it? (laughs) They died for ungratefulness. And uh, Joe, I know that uh, you noticed that in the story, and you were wondering about it, and so here it is. Our attitude of ungratefulness. Paul caught on to this too. And in Romans 1, he talked about the fact that an ungrateful heart causes people to have what's called a depraved mind. Meaning that their morality gets so degraded because they're no longer thankful for the things that God's given them. But they begin to take everything for granted. That their mind becomes depraved. Meaning that they no longer can focus on the things of God. But they only focus on trying to obtain things that feed their selfish desires. And so Paul noticed that an ungrateful heart leads to pain and sorrow as well. In fact, we read in Ezra, which is a continuation of the story we read last week in Daniel, where Daniel had prayed for God to rebuild the temple in Jerusalem. And here in Ezra, we learned that this older generation, when they saw the temple rebuilt, they wept because they were sad that it wasn't going to be as great as the temple that they had had to use in the past. They were ungrateful for what God was now providing for them, and they wanted to go back to the way it had been for them in the past spiritually. And I think we all do this at times. We look back at certain times in our life with God, and we go, God, why couldn't it be like that? Why couldn't I have the the provision that you provided in that season of my life? God, why couldn't you do that for me again? And we look back at the past not as something that we're thankful for, but as something that we're now ungrateful for what we have now from God. And Ezra experienced this. The younger generation were just excited that they had a place to worship God. But the older generation were looking towards their past. Then there is the Gospel of Matthew where Jesus is talking about the story of a rich vineyard owner. And he tells this parable where a group of people came to work for him in the morning. And they came to work for a denarii for the entire day, which is a sum of money. Another group of people he hired partway through the day. And then he hired another group at the end of the day with just an hour left. And at the end of the day, they came to him to receive their payment to the vineyard owner. And the vineyard owner gave those that had only worked an hour a denarii. So those who had worked the full day, as they're watching this, they're thinking, well, we worked all day. I guess we're going to get more than a denarii now. And so they were excited as they went to the vineyard owner, only to find out that they too would get a denarii. And instead of being grateful for a day's work in a time of drought in their area, they were unthankful for what they had received. Not because they weren't grateful for the work at the beginning of the day that would pay a denarii. They had been credibly grateful. But when they looked around and compared themselves to others, they got caught in the comparison trap. They got caught going, well, I don't have what they have. And so I'm not going to be grateful for what I have when they would have been grateful if they just had a been satisfied with what God had given them, but instead, they were comparing themselves to others. 
And because they compared themselves to others, they were no longer grateful. And Jesus knew that all of us, when we read this story, would say the words, that's not fair. It's not fair. It's not fair that the people worked, that worked one hour received the same as the people that worked all day. But God, in his great generosity, wanted to sh- ensure that everyone was provided for. And instead of being grateful that this vineyard owner was generous to everyone, so everyone had what they needed. They were upset and jealous because they got caught in the comparison trap. And I think there's all kinds of reasons. I mean, we can all relate with these. Different reasons as to why we might be ungrateful for a moment. Why we might get caught in not having an attitude of gratitude or a heart of thanksgiving. So this morning, I want us to focus in on what we personally have to be thankful for past present and future in our lives that we wouldn't look around and say well i don't have what this person has or i don't spiritually have the past that this person has or but to look at it and say what is it that god has given me that i am thankful for past present and future And this morning, we're going to build an altar, which is just a stone memorabilia of the remembrance of thanksgiving that is found throughout Scripture, where the people built a stone altar to say to God, I am thankful. And that's why you have your stones that say, I am thankful, Jesus, past, present, and future. But we're going to talk about each of these first. The first is that Abraham built an altar out of stones to give thankfulness to God for speaking to him. In Genesis 12, 7, the Lord appeared to Abraham and said, To your offspring I will give this land. So he built an altar there to the Lord who had appeared to him. Now, this would just be good advice, but if God appears to you, it'd be a good place to build an altar of thanksgiving. If you have that experience in your life, just a suggestion, stop And build an altar to God that you could go back to and remember, hey, this is the spot that God appeared to me and spoke to me. And tell your friends about it because they want to come and experience that too. But in Genesis 12, 7, this is what occurs and Abraham builds an altar. But it doesn't end there because when Abraham's going through a tough time and he begins to kind of wander from God, Abraham goes back to that altar to say, God, this is the place that you spoke to me and I'm thankful I'm thankful that you spoke to me and gave me direction in my life. And so he went from place to place until he came to Bethel to the place between Bethel and Ai where his tent had been earlier and where he had first built an altar. And he prayed to God in thanksgiving. The bottom line is we all need a place to go back to. A place to be thankful. I think we often can read the Bible, and I said this before, in a non-emotional, non-engaged way. Like these weren't real people with real stories. But I wonder if Joseph ever went back to the prison cell where he was imprisoned before he was released and became prime minister of the nation. I wonder if he ever went back to the prison cell and said, this is where it all started. This is where God first delivered me. I wonder if David ever went back to the field where he defeated Goliath through the Lord's help and said, this is the place that God protected me. I wonder if he ever went back to the place and stood there and thought, this is where God delivered my people through me. I wonder if Elijah ever went back to Mount Carmel where he called fire down from heaven and defeated the prophets of Baal and said, this is the place This was the place. Do you remember what God did here? I wonder if Zacchaeus ever went back to the tree. To the tree where Jesus had first called him out. And his life was completely changed. In that radical moment where Jesus, where everybody else refused to take part in relationship with Zacchaeus. And Jesus said, today I'll go to your house, Zacchaeus. And in that moment, everything changed for him. I wonder if he ever went back to the tree. I wonder if Peter ever went back to the Sea of Galilee, to that place where he stepped out of the boat, not to remember when he fell into the water for a lack of faith, but if he ever went back to the place where he could say, I walked on water with Jesus, 
This was the place where when I stepped out of the boat in faith and believed, I walked on water with Jesus. I wonder if Paul ever went back to the place where he got knocked off his high horse and his life was completely transformed by Jesus. Where in that moment he went blind to remind him that he was spiritually blind and killing Christians. And where Jesus forgave him and radically changed his life. See, I think throughout Scripture, there are powerful stories that we have as indicators of remembrance. As indicators to look back and go, God, we're thankful for these real people and these real stories. But we need a place in our own lives to be able to go back to, to give God thanks. To say, God, these are the moments that I remember. I remember in this place, this is what you did. God has us build altars because he wants us to have a place to go back to, to remember. To remember with thanksgiving what he's done in our lives. This week, I went back to the cow field on River Road. It was a significant moment in my life that's caused me to spend the last seven years of my life here in this community and to commit to spend the rest of my life here if God's willing. Following the call of God from the cow field where God first called me to start this church. It's a powerful place for me to remember the call of God. To go back and say, God, thank you. Thank you for putting my life on an adventure that I never dreamed would be so meaningful. All the thanks to prayer that we saw in the last month. Just a reminder when I stood in the cow field that God did all of that. He did all of that. Because of that moment. It's amazing when we go back to those places. And for each of us, it's probably going to be a different place. For some of you, it may be an experience at camp. I know some of you that grew up in the church, there was a camp that you went to, that you grew up at, that you had significant moments with God at. And when you go back to that camp, there's just something that occurs inside of you again. There's a place at the front of some churches that they have an altar where people come and pray at the end of the service. And you're a person that went to some altar at the front of some church so many times, weeping before God and saying, God, I pray that you go back to that place today. I pray that God would revive in you what he had in you so long ago. That you would remember like Abraham when you go back to that place in your mind. Of what God did. On my wall in my office are pictures of Africa. Of the incredible things that God did in our life there. But when I look at those pictures, the thing I remember most is Africa was the place where Adrian heard the call of God for my life. That Adrian had confirmation for what God had already spoken to me. That God was calling me into full-time ministry. And so when I look at those pictures, I go, God is faithful. I now have a picture of, that Sophia drew for me from when God healed her that she can see on my wall. It says, believe. And every time I look at that picture now, I'm going to remember that my God heals. Believe. And I look at my other wall, and there's a picture of the start of this church. Pictures from experiences we've had with God can be a powerful reminder an altar to go back to to remind you of what God has done in your life for some of you I believe that this past week in home church in the dreams and the big hairy audacious prayers that you wrote out in that little booklet are going to be something that you look back upon as a significant moment in your faith journey Abraham also built an altar in his life to give God thanks for what he was doing in the present in Genesis 22, 12, we find the story of Abraham taking Isaac to Mount Moriah. Now, many people see this as God testing Abraham, but I believe that Abraham was really testing himself in this moment. See, in this area, the people of the other religions were sacrificing their children to their false gods. And Abraham must have been looking around going, I wonder if I have that kind of faith. Remember, Abraham and Sarah 
waited 90 years to have their child, Isaac. It was the most significant thing in their life. It was the thing that they treasured most. And for him to lay it on the altar, he was laying everything on the altar. And so when God was saying, lay your child on the altar, Isaac was saying, God, I'm laying everything I have on the altar. Everything I've ever dreamed for, my entire future, everything I have is on this altar. It was a test for Abraham to see if he had the faith, and God didn't want him to sacrifice his son. God provided a ram. And so Abraham called this the place of Jehovah Jireh, the God who provides. And God became a significant provider. But this was a decision altar for Abraham, wasn't it? Where Abraham made a decision, am I willing to lay everything I have on the altar before God and say, God, it's all yours. I really believe that. See, lots of us can say that. God, everything I have and everything I am comes from you. But when you're actually asked to sacrifice it all, would you be willing to do that? So Abraham built an altar at this place, on the top of Mount Carmel, to signify that he was willing that he was willing to sacrifice it all to God. God didn't require it of him, but it showed Abraham that he really was willing. And I believe that all of us in our lives have just a few moments where we have decisions that will shape the rest of our lives. See, we only make a few major decisions in our lives, don't we? And the rest of our life is kind of spent working out those major decisions. Isn't that true? I mean, I remember back when, and I've told this story before, when Adrian and I had the choice when we were first starting out as a married couple. We were already giving to God generously, and we were tithing. But God told us to lay television on the altar and to stop kind of paying for cable and sponsor a child instead. And it was in that moment that I realized that I did believe that it all belonged to God. It was all his. And for the rest of my life, I seriously look back at that moment. It was a small sacrifice, $30 a month. But I look back at that moment and say, that was a decision point in my life that from then on, I knew that it all belonged to him. And so I could give away whatever God asked me to give away. Because in that moment, with a small decision that God called me to, I was faithful. And this was a decision point for Abraham. This was a moment where he had to make a decision. It was a test for him to see if he would be faithful to God in that moment or not. And I think all of us have those moments. And when we fail, we need to get back up again and make the right decision afterwards and move forward with our life. But those are the places we need to build an altar around, whether it's in our mind or in some significant way to write something down for ourselves or to take a picture or whatever it is and say, this was the decision I made for God that I believe is going to shape the rest of my life. And we can go back to those places and give God thanks because it was only by the grace of God that we were able to do those things. We also need to build altars like Abraham did for our future, though. In Genesis 13, 17 to 18, God told Abraham to walk through the land and that everything that he could see in this direction and in that direction and in that direction and in that direction would belong to him. That it would all belong to him. And before God even gave it all to him, Abraham built an altar. He built an altar of stones to say, this is the place that God gave me all this land. And I believe that's what some of you did this past week in home church, where you wrote down the big, hairy, audacious prayers that God called you to, the goals that God was setting out for you in your life. You were setting out dreams that God was going to fulfill into the future, and you were actually saying, God, I'm going to give you thanks in advance for what you're going to do in my life. That is a big, hairy, audacious prayer, isn't it? To say thanks for what you haven't received yet, knowing that you're going to receive it from God. I mean, that's a prayer of faith. But I believe that that is what God is calling us to. To remember the past and say thanks for it. Not, God, would you give it back to me? But thank you, God, for what you've done in my life. Thank you, God, for what you've done in the present right now in my life. 
And God, I want to thank you for the future because that is what communion is. Communion is the altar of the New Testament. Communion is the pilgrimage back to the foot of the cross where we remember what Jesus Christ did for us in dying for our sins and rising from the dead. It is the place where we remember at the foot of the cross what God has done. It reminds us of what Jesus has done for us. It reminds us of the place that God first said that he loved us in a way that we understood. It reminds us of that place that we first got what we didn't deserve, where we received grace and mercy. The bread reminds us of the liberation of slavery. It goes all the way back to the Old Testament where they were provided manna from heaven. That bread that reminded them of life, that they were no longer in slavery. And so the bread in the Passover meal, which is what Jesus was celebrating, was to celebrate liberty from slavery and from sin. The cup reminds us of forgiveness. This table is a table of remembrance. And so this morning, we are going to celebrate at the altar of remembrance in communion together as a church. But we're going to do that a little differently in that you have a stone that you've been given. And that stone has on it, Jesus, I'm thankful for, and then it has the words past, present, and future. And on that stone, I want you to write something that you're thankful to God for in your life in the past. And just in one or two words, not a, not a whole long sentence, just in one or two words, something that you'll remember what those words mean from your past. I want you to think of something you're thankful to God for right now in your life and say, God, this is what I'm thankful for in the present. And then to say, God, I want to give you thanks for something you're going to do in the future in my life and to give him thanks for that. And I want to bring them here and I want to create an altar around the communion table, in front of the communion table. And I want to take a picture of it. I want to take a picture of it because I want to show you this picture again again and again and again and again to say, remember what God was thank you were thankful for? We're a grateful people. Remember what you were thankful for. Be a grateful people. And then some of you are going to say, I need a new thing for my future because God's already answered it. And we're going to celebrate that as a thankful people. Then we'll take communion together. And then you can take your, your stone home and We'll remember. This is how it's going to work. This is an example that, this is mine. This is my stone. I wrote, Jesus, I'm thankful for your forgiveness. Past. Present. I'm thankful for Sophia's eyesight because for the 30 days, that was my prayer request that God would bring her eyesight back. And future, five locations of the gathering. That's what I'm, I'm praying for. That I'm believing and thankful to God for already. And then we're going to take communion. So when you're done writing, and you can start writing even now, when we're done writing, we're going to come and we're going to stand around here together as the worship team leads us in songs, and we're going to partake of communion together. And then you can take your stone home and put it somewhere to remember this day that you were thankful. Not comparing yourself to others, not comparing to the past, but God, I'm thankful for this past, present, and future in my life. I am grateful to you, Jesus. Let's pray. And then the worship team will lead us, and you can write on your stone. Jesus, we are a thankful people. We are thankful that you have done great things in our past. And this morning, we want to give you thanks for those things. God, there are things right now in this moment that we're thankful for. For some... Struggling to be thankful. But God, would you break through? Would you break through in this moment? And let them be thankful for something right now. 
Let them not focus on what they're ungrateful for, but let them focus on what they are grateful for. And God, would they turn around the thing that they're ungrateful for right now to be the thing that they're going to be grateful for in the future and say thanks for you, thanks to you now for what you're going to do in the future. Jesus, would you allow us to be a grateful people? In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.